here as a as a as a um it's um it's been brilliant i've really really enjoyed uh speaking to uh to a number of you here um uh, in stockholm and the weather's been fantastic so <laughs> that's also a nice plus um but um today i want to talk a bit about the work that we do at uh, the hci ucd group um focusing specifically on the work that we do around interaction with speech interfaces uh, and uh, design decisions that we make around those speech interfaces uh, uh, whenever we're thinking about uh, thinking about building them. So the slides, so the screen here is not working. We had some technical issues before we started. So the slides are actually online um, if you are wanting to look at the slides. There are only a few times where I will refer to the slides, so you can just look at me and go, why is this crazy person using his hands and not having any slides? You can do that. That, that also adds uh, to some risk to the proceedings. Morning. Um, so, um, so today I'm going to talk a bit about some of the things that we are looking at called, uh, and the talk today is called Alter Human, Exploring the Impact of Human Likeness to Speech Interface Design. Uh, so. Um, uh, I, I will go through the intro, um, introducing myself uh, just very quickly because I think Donnie and uh, Asian did, uh, uh, you know, so um, I have already done that to some extent. But uh, the um, basically, I'm a, um, a co-PI at the Adapt Center uh, within uh, uh, this uh, one of the large research centers in Ireland, uh, very similar to as Donnie was saying to Digital Futures. Um, and my interests are in speech interface design and interaction. Uh, as well as cognitive and experimental psychology and psycholinguistics. And this is really the background that I try and bring to the work um, uh, that we do in Dublin. And uh, the work doesn't happen in a, uh, in a vacuum. It's not just me doing the work. It's a fantastic team of people um, at UCD uh, who, uh, who are working with me. I feel privileged to be working with, and I'm going to be presenting some of their work here today. Um, so the work that we're presenting is from uh, Dr. Phil Doyle, who uh, submitted and passed his PhD very recently, um, uh, as well as some work that uh, we conducted with Dr. Lee Clark, who uh, is now at Swansea, but has moved to industry um, to conduct uh, some work around speech interfaces, as well as Orla Cooney, one of our uh, PhD students uh, working on mental health technologies with uh, speech. Um, and uh, as well as Justin Edwards and Diego Garialdi, who are cognitive scientists uh, in background. And so uh, the work that we'll be discussing is, uh, is uh, in collaboration with them, uh, but we've got some great people working in Dublin uh, around the questions of what it means to interact with speech systems and how that impacts our language when we're interacting uh, uh, with this. So um, uh, and I'll, I'll pass the, I'll put the slides online somewhere as well so you can access those. And if you want to contact anybody in the lab, I would really encourage you to do so because they'd love to hear from you um, uh, across doing that as well. So when we're interacting uh, uh, with, uh, so, you know, so, so, so speech systems have grown considerably over the past 15, 20 years in terms of their use. They've been around uh, uh, a lot of the time in terms of uh, in the lab or being used by for specific, uh, specific uses. Um, uh, such as dictation or interactive voice response systems. You remember those banking phone lines that you phone and you have to say yes to whenever the, uh, there's an option you want. Um, so speech has been around for a while as a modality, but it has grown in popularity over the past uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, and in particular, in terms of HCI research, there's been a real boom in, uh, in, um, in the amount of research that we see around conversational interfaces or around speech systems uh, in particular, trying to understand why we behave the way we do, uh, as well as what's the user experience things that we need to consider whenever we're uh, designing uh, a speech interface. What does that mean? What does it mean to design a speech interaction and to make sure that we design it with a user experience in mind? Now, the thing for me, though, is that the fact that I'm really interested in communication uh, between people. So, uh, well, I, you know, that, that's where my, uh, uh, a lot of my background is, a lot of my interest is during my postdoc. And so um, what we've been doing in UCD is to try and pair theories of language production, why people produce the words they do, uh, and trying to bring that into speech interface design. Why will we then design speech interfaces the way that we do, and how does that influence what we say to them? And this is what I'm going to touch on today when we talk about being human and what it means to be human-like with these types of interfaces. So UCD in the lab, so the UCHCI UCD group, we concentrate on 
fundamentally on two questions. So firstly, what influences our perceptions of speech systems? So in terms of design, what is it that, what is it that impacts our perceptions of their capabilities and competence? Uh, and then the second one being, well, how does that influence what we say? So, you know, sometimes design decisions will not impact what people say to systems. Some people might ask, well, what's the point in worrying about them then? Um, but there's a thing about, well, we need to understand what is driving the user experience. But some may be fundamental to the decision-making process that we have whenever we decide what to say to a system. And so that's what we try and look at in, in our lab is to try and figure out which ones are really key to, uh, to language production and user behavior and interaction and how people perceive uh, systems based on design. So as we probably noticed, whenever you, uh, you, whenever you look at speech interfaces or whenever you interact with speech interfaces, that this human likeness element is a key factor whenever you're interacting with uh, with a speech system. So they sound human, the synthesis is very human-like. Um, you know, they're using, they're using speech as the modality of interaction. So it means that there's already fundamentally something baked in that's human-like in terms of the interaction. So this is, so, uh, so the interaction is built around that, that fundamental idea. Um, now, the, one of the other things here as well is that whenever you're thinking about human likeness, it's a design decision at the same time. So we don't have to make these systems sound human-like, and we don't have to make them say things in a human-like way. But we make that decision based on potential things like intelligibility or trying to cue something about the interface or about the design that makes us potentially behave in a particular more predictable way. Um, and so uh, what we uh, what we kind of research in our lab is this idea of what people assume a system might be able to do and say. And this concept in psycholinguistics, as well as in the research that we're doing, is termed partner models. So it's this idea that we have a conceptualization of what a system can do and can understand as a dialogue partner. And design is probably likely is likely to be impactful for that. So if we choose the system to be, have a human-like voice, it will try, it will change our partner models in terms of the capabilities and perceptions that we have for what a system can and can't do. So we conducted some research to try and figure out uh, whether this was the case. Uh, and I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about that just now, but I'm gonna describe a bit more about what the hell are these partner model things? Uh, so what is this concept in particular? So this is very similar to the, to the idea of mental models. So if you're familiar with the idea of mental models uh, in, in human computer interaction and cognitive psychology, uh, and this is just more focused on the idea of the, co uh, the combination of this or the, 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 the use of this concept in a dialogue. So uh, partner model is an interlocutor's cognitive representation of their beliefs uh, and uh, about their partner's communicative capability. So it's really like whether the system is a good or a bad communicator, whether it will understand what I'm able to say, what's its base knowledge state? So what does it know about the situation? What does it know about the context? Um, and these are, tend to be formed uh, based on evidence uh, from, um, um, from psycholinguistics research based on previous experience with an interlocutor, so with a dialogue partner, um, as well as from assumptions and stereotypes. So there may be some assumptions we make specifically about systems in terms of how good or bad they are as communication partners, and they may drive what we say and do to them. Uh, and same thing with things like stereotypes around the particular voices that we use or the particular design decisions that we make. These, importantly, are probably dynamic. Now, this is one of the major problems we have whenever measuring this concept of partner models. So we know that there's a sense of design might be impacting these models, but how does that dynamically change over time? And that's a significant challenge to look at in the future about how we then measure that over the interaction and afterwards. But there's a debate in psycholinguistics and a debate in the HCI uh, uh, research community about how much these models actually influence what we say and do. So that's some of the evidence that I'm going to be showing today is going to be looking at whether we can make some uh, whether we can make some assessments around that. Now, why do I keep on mentioning partner models here, or why do I uh, think this is an important thing to emphasize? Well, it's because in some recent research that I published at Kai uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the human likeness uh, or comparisons about to, between human likeness or human elements of communication are key to these models and are key, a kind of a key linchpin that is used to make assumptions about capability uh, within this interaction. 
So we also conducted some research to highlight when we were, so back in 2017, we had the kind of question of going, well, these, these perceptions of, of, uh, of a uh, speech system as a communicative partner might be really important, uh, but we don't know what, what makes them, and we don't know what might influence them. Uh, and so we conducted a, uh, a focus group, uh, focus group research, uh, looking at how people experience speech interfaces like Siri. So in particular, in this case, this was Siri because it was the most prominent uh, intelligent personal assistant at the time. Um, and what we did is we asked infrequent uh, users of speech systems, which is the most common form of uh, of users with with, uh, with speech interfaces as they are at the moment. You don't see very many power users of things. You don't see many people asking for the weather a thousand times. Uh, during the day, for instance. Um, and we recruited these participants from UCD, uh, and we asked them to discuss the, the, the challenges that they face whenever interacting with systems and how they perceive them as partners whenever they're interacting with them. So as part of the work, we asked uh, uh, the, the 20 participants that took part to uh, go through a number of standard tasks that you see in speech, speech interface interaction. So these are things like kind of searching for a piece of information, getting the weather, setting reminders, searching for recipes. These kind of tasks that are very common when you interact with a speech agent. Um, now, uh, and this... This kind of stuff has been uh, confirmed uh, recently in a Tokai paper a couple of years ago. This basically, this is what they, what people use uh, uh, things like Alexa and Google uh, Assistant for mostly. And what we found when we did a thematic analysis of the comments from uh, from the users and the focus groups was that there are a number of issues that people had, or a number of barriers that they had for interaction, uh, but also there's a number of uh, uh, of themes that came out that showed us that there is some elements about the design that may be important for these perceptions of communicative capability. And so we had issues such as uh, issues with hands-free interaction. So, you know, people didn't like the fact that Siri sometimes brought up information on the phone rather than giving it through speech when they're doing hands busy, eyes busy uh, kind of tasks. So for instance, we're doing some work, uh, doing some work with uh, Donnie at the moment looking at cooking scenarios. So imagine if Siri brought up visual information rather than you're busy doing something else, it can be kind of, a, kind of annoying. So there are, there are aspects about the problems of interaction that came out from this, uh, from this um, uh, study. But the two key uh, things for partner models are, um, were that people felt that there were some issues with speech recognition performance, which is a common uh, complaint when it comes to speech interfaces. Um, and that this might be very, very important for uh, impacting the perceptions of these systems as communicative partners. So imagine if you have recognition problems all the time, you're going to start thinking, well, maybe this isn't a, a fantastic interlocutor to interact with. I might change my speech accordingly. And we see that in, in, in interaction data where people change uh, the way they speak to systems to try and adapt to make sure that they uh, can interact successfully. But the key one for this talk and the key one uh, that I'm going to emphasize is almost universally everybody mentioned the human-like nature of these systems. So it was, uh, the comparison was not asked for in the data. We didn't, so not asked for by the participants. We didn't ask them to make that comparison, but almost everybody in this data highlighted and compares Siri to human-like dialogue and human-like comparisons, mentioning things such as the personality within the voice or how the voice makes them think about particular things that they can and can't do. Now, this echoes work by Luger and Sellen in 2016 that found this in power users. So they found this, that they, uh, that they what they call the kind of gulf of expectation um, um, and what Norman calls the gulf of expectation too, where there's a sense of that the, a human-like design of a system might cue abilities uh, that the system is not able to fulfill when it comes to, to the interaction. So a number of people in Luger and Sellens uh, work highlighted that the, uh, the aspects of the design might make people feel that they're really advanced, but actually that the systems can, can only deal with uh, very kind of simple adjacency pair dialogues, for instance, or very simple kind of command constructions. So this human-like nature of IPA, so from this, from this work and from others, has kind of highlighted, well, maybe this human-like design is, is possibly something that might be causing problems with people's mental models, with people's views of what a system can and can't do, uh, and, uh, and therefore might be an interesting thing to look for in terms of the partner models. So we took this piece of work and then went, right, okay, so human likeness might be an incredibly important thing to consider when it comes to how people scaffold or, or, or try and identify what the partner can and can't do from a communicative uh, perspective. 
Now, the thing is that human likeness was being described as a kind of a, a, a blob, like a kind of thing that you that, that is is generally just this thing that that, that, that happens, or the thing that's chosen in terms of the, in, ter in terms of design. And we kind of had a thought that maybe this isn't just a unidimensional thing. It's not like you know you, there's a loads of decisions that go into making a system human-like. But we wanted to see from users whether that comes out of the data of how they describe speech systems and how they describe speech interfaces. And so what we did is we conducted a, uh, a piece of work um, uh, trying to identify how people, what words people use to describe speech agents as conversational partners. Um, and this led us to uh, find that basically human likeness is multidimensional. So there's, uh, there's a, multi, multi, uh, a number uh, of constructs, a number of dimensions that are important to that perception of human likeness. So we conducted some work uh, using uh, what's called the repertory grid technique. Uh, and the repertory grid technique works by uh, basically you're, um, uh, you're asked to interact with a set of entities. Uh, in this case, the entities, well, sorry, in the entities in, in the technique usually have to vary on some dimension, uh, and you have two that are similar, one that's different. So personal construct theory, uh, uh, so this is used for kind of um, um, uh, personal construct theory uh, in, um, in, uh, in, in, in clinical psychology, it's used quite often too. Um, and so what we did is we tried to run a study here that used this repertory grid technique to get to descriptions of how partners perceive, uh, how people perceive speech agents as communicative partners. So in terms of three entities, we had people interact or engage with a person, uh, which was one of the members of the lab. So, uh, uh, so Adil was uh, our, um, our, um, our, our person. Uh, and then we had two similar entities, so two similar uh, uh, dialogue partners that they interacted with, one of them being Amazon Echo, so the Echo Stack, uh, and, then the, uh, and then Siri uh, on a mobile phone. So these are two similar um, uh, two similar uh, entities, and then there was uh, the um, uh, and then there was a human partner that were involved in uh, in there too. And what we asked, we asked them to do nine predetermined questions or predetermined kind of conversational prompts to get them to uh, to interact with these uh, with these partners. And the aim of this is to get people to be exposed to the differences in terms of the capabilities and competence that each of these participants have over interaction. And so we, we split the questions or the, the, uh, the request types that people had into three, uh, into three categories. So the first one being conversational, so things like, how are you today? Uh, where are you from? Um, and uh, all the way down to the subjective. So do you like insert a genre of music or insert a, 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 a particular artist? Or what do you think of insert a famous person's name? Uh, we also had information retrieval. So thing is like, you know, um, how do I get to the city center from here? So the tasks were chosen because some of them are really good for speech interfaces and some of them are really good for humans to do. And so that gives us a sense of being able to explore the capabilities, the differences in the capabilities that are there. What, you then, what we then do, did here and what happens in, in the repertory grid technique is you ask people to generate uh, uh, particular words that describe the similarities and differences that they've experienced whenever interacting with these partners. And so this is called the construct elicitation phase. And so you get people to look at um, uh, implicit constructs. So ask people to write a list of words, the first words that come to mind about the similarities and differences, and you ask them to write them out. Then when they've finished or exhausted that, you ask them to generate what's called emergent constructs. So things that are uh, that basically uh, are the opposite uh, words to the original word. And so we're asking them to kind of create antonyms whenever it comes to, to those words. And what we end up with, with each participant, is creating a set of items that look like a kind of a, a, a semantic differential questionnaire, but an individual one that they've created themselves uh, for that. Then they're asked to place the partners on that particular scale. And this is used more for, uh, this is used to inform the thematic analysis we did of the, uh, of the constructs to try and look at where people are rating the system versus where people are rating the person. Uh, in uh, in that regard. And so uh, we found that there's some key dimensions when it comes to human likeness uh, from this. So the way that we did this was we did, uh, we thematically um, uh, grouped uh, the, um, the, uh, the pairs of words. Uh, so three of us in the lab did this independently and then we came together to look at, and there's about 250, 260 word pairs that came on through here as a long task. Um, and uh, and uh, so we did this independently, 
came together uh, and resolved any kind of differences in terms of themes and discussed those through. Uh, and there was some really good interrater reliability uh, within these. And we found that there are about, uh, so there are some key dimensions here. So the first one being partner knowledge set. So whether the uh, knowledge that the partner might have is seen as something that's that's attributable to, to, to human partners. So for instance, I'll talk about, a bit about this in a second, but people thought that there is types of knowledge that came out. So for instance, opinions that are much better in terms of humans can give those opinions versus systems. When systems gave them, they were seen as kind of fake to do so. So uh, same thing with humor. So humor was seen as an element or when we're asked people to tell uh, someone a joke, people felt that, well, that kind of functionality or that knowledge is generally more, more human-like in nature. And when a system does it, it doesn't seem to be that appropriate. So there's a sense of what type of knowledge we assume a partner to have, or we assume that, that aspect to have, and what's the human-like knowledge that we'd expect, and what's kind of a more system-oriented knowledge that we'd expect. So an example, like if you had like a, um, you know, ask somebody what's the square root of 4,070, whatever, then it might be really hard <laughs> for someone to come up with that knowledge really quickly, but a system can do that really, really quickly. There's also this element of interpersonal connection. There are a group of words that people use to describe the interpersonal connection differences that people have with systems and humans. So there is a sense of that there is, uh, some of these qualities are much more human-like. So uh, an element of uh, you know, kind of sociability or a sense of uh, having a connection were seen as a lot more, uh, lot more relevant to the human-like uh, aspects of things in the systems. We also have things like linguistic content, the words that are being used by a particular partner, a particular system. The, also the elements of, of things such as partner identity and role. So people were clear that there is a difference in terms of capabilities between humans and machines, just because of the sheer fact that one of them is a machine and one of them is a human. Like as, as Susan Brennan said in a, in a keynote at Cooey in 2019, users aren't dumb. This human likeness thing isn't about fooling users, it's about queuing particular things, but that people have a clear distinction about these capabilities and a clear distinction of the partners that they have. And they therefore make clear stereotypical assumptions about what one partner can do and what one partner can. The other one that we have here is vocal qualities. So there are many of them that mention aspects of the synthesis. So whether the synthesis is human-like, whether the synthesis uh, feels like it has personality, uh, whether it feels like it has some element of emotion within it. So there's one of the dimensions there too when it thinks about design is this aspect of vocal qualities. So when we're designing elements here, we can think about the elements of particularly linguistic content and vocal qualities, as well as the role and identity that the, that the partner is being placed in. But as I mentioned before, there are a number of things that people thought that systems were bad at and that people were good at, as well as what people are good at, people are bad at and systems are good at. So things like fact-based and universal bookish knowledge was seen as a really kind of a, 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 a thing that systems are very good at, but rather than being experiential-based knowledge or contextualized knowledge, they felt that the systems that they were interacting with in the experiment were pretty terrible for that. So there's a sense of, of, of perceiving the type of knowledge that might be, be able to be interacted with or being able to be used in an interaction was, uh, was, uh, was, was important there. And also this idea of, of, of simulating interpersonal connection was seen as quite fake for, for a system because people are like, well, they're systems. They don't have, they don't have feelings. They don't have like this idea of being, you know, um, uh, they don't have this idea of, you know, understanding uh, emotional connection or have a sense of trying to make an emotional connection with me. So there was a sense of maybe that that's sometimes a bit wrongheaded where we're going in terms of the direction of the interaction whenever it's trying to design emotionally aware empathic agents. There seems to be something fundamental that people make about stereotype of a system as being not really able to go down those roads in the same way that we do. So we have this idea that human likeness might be multidimensional in focus, and there's a number of different areas that people focus on whenever thinking about the human likeness of a system. But does that matter? Does it actually impact anything that we, uh, that we do in the interaction? And there's been a lot of work over the years that has looked at, uh, looked at this. So things such as computers and social actors, um, looks at the idea that we use um, you know, cues uh, from uh, from seeing the system as a social actor to be able to to be able to influence our language or influence our perceptions as well uh, in in forms of interaction. But that's not just with speech systems; that's with other forms of systems. So, uh, so NASA's work focused on TV, focused on all sorts of other types of technology, and that we make this kind of anthropomorphism uh, kind of judgment uh, in the interaction 
Um, but he also stresses in the work that there is this clear division. There's a clear division between, a, between something that is a system and something that is a human. And so you're not making that kind of, you're not being fooled by it, but there's this, there is this dichotomy. But the key thing that NAS and uh, NAS et al, as well as some of the stuff that we're looking at at the moment suggests is that we come with this idea that we've got a little bit of, of kind of baggage when it comes to uh, the interaction with, uh, with speech systems. So we use heuristics in the interaction that might be able to guide us. And that is perfectly you know, feasible and understandable from a cognitive perspective, because uh, we want to scaffold what we can do with a system. So remember with a speech system, unlike a voice interface, unlike a visual interface, you need to try and scaffold what you're doing just based on the sound alone, or just based on what the, uh, what the, uh, the voice system is doing or what it outputs. So using heuristics that we have from communication makes sense uh, when it comes to guiding our interaction. Uh, and when we're using human-like voices, we're priming those heuristics. We're giving people that information to say, well, maybe you should use this as a piece of information to influence your language choices or influence your perceptions. And so this is what kind of NAS was, uh, uh, was getting at with, his, uh, with the things such as the media equation, but computers and social actors as well. And so one of the things that we want to do is that we want to see whether that impacts language choices. So does that influence the types of words that we might use? And so, um, and so we did an experiment that particularly looked at, uh, looked at this and looked at whether the, um, uh, the synthetic voice that's used in terms of the, or the accent of the synthetic voice, as well as stressing that a system is of a particular nationality, will influence the type of word that you use whenever you're describing an item. And this relies on the difference between American English and Hiberno English. So um, for instance, there are many words that vary when you think about the lexical choice you can make between Hiberno English and American English. One of them that you might see on the screens now is looks like a lovely herb there. So cilantro would be the, uh, the US English version, um, but the uh, Hiberno English or the British English version would be coriander, right? So, so if I was to describe this, so I always want to put some aspects on the slides that hark back to Ireland. So I've got our president here. So you might see our president, Michael D. Higgins, uh, uh, on your slides. Um, I haven't asked for permission to use his, uh, to use his image. Um, but um, so if I was to ask Michael D. Higgins, uh, you know, pass me the, uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, when we're shopping together in Aldi, for instance, and we're, you know, we hit the herbs, and I'm just, uh, I say, you know, uh, Michael D., pass me the uh, coriander. So that would be me designing to that audience, because I know that you'll understand that as a Hiberno English speaker. Uh, I, I also, I could also say, pass me the cilantro. Now that might get me a bit of a kind of an odd look, but he might not, he might know what I mean. But that makes the efficiency of the dialogue a little bit, a little bit less efficient. So, um, and in that case, I, I wouldn't be tailoring my knowledge to his, uh, my utterance to his knowledge. Same thing with Elizabeth Warren. So if I interact with Elizabeth Warren and we're doing the same task, uh, and I say, uh, Elizabeth, please pass me the cilantro. She'd know exactly what I meant. And I'm, I'm, uh, I am designing my utterance based on that knowledge. Um, but if I say pass me the coriander, she might still know what I mean, but it makes it, uh, but it, makes it uh, less efficient uh, to do so. So this is what's called audience design. So we design our utterances based on our assumed knowledge of our partners and their capabilities. And so this is an example of audience design and human dialogue. Uh, we want to see whether the design patterns that's used, the human-like design patterns, actually influence this in human-machine dialogue. So do we see that element of audience design in human-machine dialogue? And if so, is that because of the voice or because of the cues of nationality of the system? So in this experiment, we had two, two stages. So stage one, we uh, gave uh, participants uh, basically a, uh, what we call the memory test. Uh, and this, is, this technique is used quite a lot in social psychology whenever trying to give information before uh, that you need for the experiment, but trying to give it kind of surreptitiously. Um, and so we gave people a, um, a set of items and we asked them to read the English name and the American name and memorize those because we had to ask them about them at the end of the experiment. So we did that at stage one. Uh, and this ensures that they have the knowledge to make the decision, because uh, if, we, if we don't have that before, we don't have an ability for someone to make that decision if they want to. So that was uh, stage one. Stage two then got people to interact in what's called a referential communication task. And this is where you basically take turns as a partner and an, uh, as, a, as a matcher and a namer to uh, name images uh, in an interaction. This technique is used 
very widely in psycholinguistics to look at audience design effects as well as lexical alignment, as well as other types of effects uh, that we see in terms of lexical production. And so uh, if you look at the slides now, you'll see the game uh, that was uh, devised. It is fabulous in visuals, isn't it? Uh, and uh, so this is, um, this is uh, the game that was used. Uh, you have a number of uh, screens and you take turns being the matcher and the namer. So uh, in this uh, situation, the top of the screen here highlights that uh, this is what you would see if you were the matcher. The part so as a participant, you'd hear it's the book. So this is the description. The task for you as the, as the namer, as the matcher here, is to select the book, right? So that's your task in that, in that. The screen then moves on, and then you become the namer. You have to name something to your partner. So um, and the, what you have to name will have a red box over it. And in this case, we had some filler items so to hide the, uh, the the focus of the study for the particular items. But I, I can't remember how many items I think it was. I think it was 18 items that were particularly that had that you could use an American uh, English or uh, a Hiberno English uh, variant for. So an example is on the slides here. So you could say it's a spanner, or you could say it's the wrench. Right. So you're making a decision. You're going to make a decision about what you, what you need to say there. Uh, and so the hypothesis was that with systems that were that had uh, Irish accented speech. Uh, uh, versus American accented speech, we might see fewer uh, uh, people using American uh, English terms whenever the system was Irish accented versus when it was uh, American accented or they were told that it was, it was a US based system. And so I've got the synthesis here, but I'm not going to dare play uh, some of the things. I've kept it on the slides here. If you want to listen to this, it's Sarah Voice Caitlin and uh, Sarah Voice Hannah. Um, so I might give it a go here just now, but. No, I don't think you'd be hearing that. So um, that's, I, I had to mute my sounds because of the because of the feedback. So um, so we had these two conditions: so Irish accented speech and U.S. accented speech. And what we find is that we they, uh, when we run linear mixed effects models, log linear mixed effects models, sorry, on the uh, the likelihood of choosing the American uh, English name, we see that that's increased slightly higher when you see it with U.S. Uh, partners versus Irish partners. Now. This is, again, a design decision that we're making. We can, we, we've used this design decision as a human-like design decision, so looking at the synthesis that we're choosing, and that we're choosing to make accented synthesis. And it clearly has a different, uh, it clearly has an impact on what people are saying in terms of the interaction. So this effect is statistically significant. However, I want you to notice here as well that there are, uh, that people are more likely to use the US lexical term, but people still use the Hiberno English alternative in most in, in, in a number of cases. And so this is what's termed kind of egocentric bias in interaction. Uh, and so um, I will, uh, I can talk a little bit more about that whenever we uh, do kind of Q and A, because we also do work around egocentric bias in interaction. So making decisions, linguistic decisions that are easy for you, not for your partner. Um, and uh, so in this case, we see that there is some elements of audience design. This is a clear audience design effect. And so design is cueing that. Design is gonna be cueing that kind of thing. Laboring the fact that a system is of a particular nationality with a particular accent has led has led people to more likely use those types of words. Now the problem is, so so it does seem to have some impact on what people do whenever they're interacting with speech interfaces and speech, with speech systems. Now that might not always be the case, but if it's if it's salient to do so, people may take those into account. So we we know that human likeness is a, is a design decision that's being utilized. That design decision has an impact on language choices. And the thing is though, there seems to be some element of, or some barriers around doing this. So partners also have views that systems cannot cope or cannot do certain things that humans can do. So things like being emotionally aware or thing, things of some elements like this. So. There's an element of the design cueing and changing our behaviors or, or, or influencing our language choices. But my question is that really, should we be aiming for this human aspect element at all? It does influence what we say and what we, and what we do. But is that the right thing to be doing? Should we really be doing that uh, if a system cannot cope with some of the responses that may, be, that may be gathered? Do people actually even want it in the first place? Are we just doing this because it seems like the right thing to do, rather than knowing that users might feel it's the right thing to do, or knowing that they want this? Now, this isn't a new idea. So this is a uh, this is something that Roger Moore's talked about an awful lot in in the, in, in speech tech research about appropriateness of voices or appropriateness of system cues when it comes to interaction. And so the question that we had was, especially when it comes to more advanced capabilities, like it's okay if you're naming an object or if you're kind of doing a uh, a sense of, uh, of you know, something that a system can easily cope with. But what about something about true conversation? 
So systems are not very good at doing conversation development, so open, open dialogue. So, um, you know, they're getting much, much better in terms of being able to do stuff, but there's a load of challenges there in this type of interaction. So what happens, what do people perceive uh, in terms of the conversation with a system? And does that make this aspect, this idea of kind of open or more human-like conversational chit-chat dialogues, as well as more task-oriented dialogues, a bit tricky to, uh, to, to, to get to with, uh, with the users? So basically, this kind of boils down to the idea, do we want to uh, be a bit more like the interaction uh, in her, where you see Theodore Twombly uh, interacting with Samantha in a very human-like way. They're having conversations, chats, as well as doing task-oriented dialogues in an incredibly human-like way, uh, to the point where he obviously falls in love with his uh, operators. I hate how I wreck the ending. I apologize, but I'm sure a number of people have watched this already. Um, so he falls in love with his interface and then finds out that she's been, you know, that she's... Um, She's also, uh, you know, the, the love interest of 40,000 other, other users. Um, so uh, do we want to go down that road? Or do we want to kind of think about maybe designing systems or designing the conversations that we have or the interactions that we have more with the constraints in mind? So not going human max in terms of the capabilities that we give these systems, but being more aware that the systems are actually limited in what they can do and being more honest about that. So in this, we uh, conducted uh, some inter uh, interviews with uh, participants looking at uh, what they feel is, um, uh, what, they, what, they, um, what they think about whenever they think about a conversation with a system and a conversation with a human. So um, we tried to identify what are the properties of conversation. And then uh, we asked people to then reflect on those whenever interacting with, uh, with uh, speech interfaces or with, uh, with, uh, with, with machines. We're actually a little bit more open than just saying existing speech interfaces. It was more about kind of a more future looking element of, uh, of uh, what people might see as the qualities of conversation with, uh, with, uh, with automated, uh, automated partners. And this was part of a project where we were trying to build uh, a system that was going to be uh, conversational in the sense that it incorporates ta uh, task oriented dialogues and social talk. So it was this idea that how do we come up with user requirements for this type of interaction? And so this is where it fundamentally came to is adding these human-like capabilities to a system and whether we should be doing that in the first place. So when people were reflecting about what what people, what's, what's good about a conversation with, with, with others, um, you know, there's the typical stuff that we see in sociolinguistics, this aspect that conversation is used for social and transactional purposes. So it's used to kind of shoot the breeze and to kind of to create social bonds, as well as, uh, you know, talking for the sake of talking, uh, as well as transactional purposes. We might be using it to get tasks done, to get things done in interaction. Um, so people are aware of that in human conversation. There's also the priority of mutual understanding and common grounds. Now, this isn't new to anybody from, you know, who, uh, who, who knows work around kind of, you know, of hard parts work on common ground and mutual understanding. This is a common thing that is important to be seen in conversation where with another individual, you're building common ground and you're building that mutual understanding, shared knowledge together. Also, there's an element of conversation being important for building trustworthiness between people, uh, and then that leads to kind of more social-based uh, transactions that can be conducted. We also have this aspect of whenever someone is in conversation, they're conducting, they're being active, and they're participating in the dialogue. So they're either cueing things such as head nods or gestures, being an active listener and an active participant. And humor being a very important part of all of these processes. So adding elements of humor being very important in terms of, uh, in terms of, in terms of scaffolding some of these. Now, th th well, then what we did was, again, when we were asking people to reflect on some of these, was that we uh, just flipped in the interview and said, look, can you, uh, you know, you've come up with a number of uh, aspects that are important for human conversation. How do you feel these are reflected in machine conversation or in a conversation with speech, with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with speech agents? And then what we saw was that basically people then completely emphasized the elements of transactional over social. So they felt that conversations with agents should be far more transactional than being social in nature. So, and that echoes a little bit towards the, the, the work that we saw where whenever social capabilities are, are conducted in a system or added in a system, it was seen as generally a bit fake to do so. 
So there's this sense of that maybe that there's the uh, agent-based conversation is fundamentally seen by users as task-oriented in the first place. So there's that sense of can we, even if we could technologically get to the human-like capability of a social, a social agent, would participants ever see that connection in the same way? Probably not. Um, there's also a sense of kind of this idea of one-way understanding. So the understanding of the true sense of whether being whether you, the statement that is being stated that is being said by the agent is truly understood in its meaning, or whether it's just recognised and then uh, and, and then used to guide the next step of a dialogue. Um, we also had this idea of personalization versus common ground. So rather than then talking about common ground and building shared representation, building shared knowledge, there was a sense of that a system could or should be able to personalize to them. Uh, so it's rather than it being very focused on this idea of building that together as a, as a, as a shared joint task, that, person, that, that was seen as kind of like an agent prioritizing personalization to that particular user as that dimension. There are also clear status effects. So how the uh, agent is seen as a dialogue partner. So, and partner being the key word that was very rarely mentioned, um, where it ends up that a system is seen as generally kind of sometimes subservient to the participant. So, uh, so to the user. So the, it's the, the system is there to conduct the task that the, uh, that the, that, um, uh, that the user has, has stated. And therefore, you know, the aspects of kind of conversational uh, dialogue uh, may not necessarily be the most useful uh, in particular contexts, as well as this idea of building up trust. So whenever they are asked to reflect on this idea of building up trust with an agent, it was, well, actually, it's more important being functionally trustworthy uh, rather than being a, tr a kind of a more kind of social trustworthiness that we see in, in uh, human-like communication. So there's this aspect, this complete shift in terms of how people see those dimensions in machine dialogue. Uh, and so they wanted it to perform uh, better in terms of recognition, in terms of the dialogue management, in terms of those type of technical competencies, as well as being better in terms of privacy of data, rather than seeing it as being kind of a social uh, trustworthiness uh, 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 building as well. And so, so, so this, this brought us to the idea of, well, actually, you know, the idea of conversation with systems or the idea of the interaction of speech with systems may never be like, you know, the same way that we try and develop human-like aspects with, uh, you know, human conversation. It may never be the same, but there are, there are dimensions that might actually give a kind of ceiling effect to how much we can actually make that interaction human-like. And so the argument we make in the paper is that actually, you know, speech interface conversation is a completely different form of communication. So we should be looking at it as a different form of conversation and designing for that and designing for those affordances, those affordances and those capabilities to be communicated appropriately so we can interact appropriately with the systems rather than emulate, trying to emulate in human-like capabilities. And so the question is like, you know, is that really appropriate as we go forward? Should we really be emulating those processes? Because there seems to be a clear kind of, even if it's stereotypical in terms of the people view speech interfaces, there maybe seems to be a barrier about how much human life we can actually get, not just from a technical perspective, but from a perspective that people might be perceiving the systems as system, as system communicators themselves, their own type of entity of communicator. So our, one of the questions we have here is, is, is there actually a ceiling effect to how much humanness actually works and guides us? It might be really good for simple tasks, but actually if you could just kind of terms and elements of complexity, um, people don't really kind of buy that type of interaction as appropriately with, uh, with, um, with, with speech systems. So, um, and also, like, you know, this aspect of how this might scaffold our perceptions of capabilities with speech systems, we need to think about what we're doing whenever we choose those human-like designs. So, um, you know, we might be scaffolding that kind of capability in a very, very, uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that means that the interaction isn't going to go as smoothly as if we were actually just honest about the capability differences. And that's not to say that that might change in the future. So this work is at where we are at the moment. That doesn't mean it's where we're going to be in 20, 30 years. So this research does need to be replicated over the years to see how that shifts and changes. But there are, and there are also certain situations where that human likeness and design might be appropriate. So, you know, uh, working on, uh, on, on aspects around kind of healthcare technologies, where you add aspects like politeness into the language that's used in interaction, 
might lead to some emotional elements of connection that may not be uh, appropriate in the types of tasks that we see in our general voice agents uh, right now. So this might also be context dependent. So we need to be aware when we're designing for human likeness that the, the aspect of context as well as the design might be doing particular things. And so uh, with that, I'm just going to thank the, uh, so uh, with the, I'm going to thank the sponsors of the work. So uh, the Cognitive Projects, which was funded by the Irish Research Council, the ADAPT Centre, who have funded a lot of this work, and Science Foundation Ireland, as well as the support of UCD and the HCI at UCD Group, and everybody at the HCI at UCD Group who's been involved in this work. Uh, I feel really privileged to be working with such great people uh, there in the, uh, in the lab. Uh, and so with that, I'm just going to say thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions.